Are you a um, fan of intermittent fasting daily? I'm a fan of intermittent fasting for people with poor blood sugar regulation. I don't think intermittent fasting is good for everybody. Just like I don't think keto is good for everybody. Just like I don't think vegan diets are good for everybody. But we know um, Beyond Meats is not good for anyone. Beyond Meats is not good for anybody. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'd rather I'd actually <laughs> rather eat the plastic carton that comes in than eat the because <laughs> I just crap that out. <laughs> All right, today I've got the man behind 10X Health, Grant Cardone's newest venture, where I've heard a ton of great things about it. I got the chance to meet this man a few months back when I was in Miami, and you know a bunch of my friends have been doing 10X Health, and it's been going pretty good. So I decided to get a test myself. <laughs> and so right here, I actually have my test results um, of a genetic test to see basically how I can improve. And... I've, I've yet to go through them and, uh, you know, so we're going to go through them live on the show and you're going to see exactly what I'm going through. But before we go through these tests, I actually want to introduce the man and have him talk about what exactly 10X Health is doing and how the business has grown and how it can really help a lot of entrepreneurs and people in general. So I've got none other than Gary Brecco. What's up, man? How you doing? It's Good. great to be here. Yeah. So I saw you um, first, like with Dana White, like this, how long ago did this start? Um, so it's been about six months now, seven months. Yeah. Since we started working with Dana. Yeah. I saw him like talking about this revolutionary thing. And then, um, later I found out, I'm like, oh, that's Grant's thing with Gary and like, okay, now it's all starting to make sense. Right. How did he even find you? So he was referred to me by a friend of his named, uh, Carrie Kasem. If you remember, uh, Casey Kasem's weekly top 40, it's kind of my generation, but, um, her father, uh, so Carrie Kasem, his daughter, is a good friend of Dana's and a friend of mine. And she referred me to Dana as a gift to Dana because he had done a lot for her in her life. And she said, hey, my gift back to you is I'm going to introduce you to Gary Brecka. And mm. He's going to change your life. That's amazing. So, you know, we'll get into what 10X Health actually is, but mm -hmm. what were you doing before this? So before that, I had um, a wellness uh, company that was treating Grant Cardone, amongst other people. And... Uh, it was based out of Naples, Florida, and we got Grant Cardone as a patient. And three years into into treating Grant, he said, "Listen, we we've, we've got to put this together and and put it on the 10x platform and use my ability to scale this and really bring it to the masses." So he acquired us in September of last year, uh, September of 2021, and it's been kind of a meteoric parabolic rise ever since then because they're, they're real yeah. experts at scaling a business um I'm, I'm kind of expert at science and <laughs> knew really not a lot about scaling a business and uh then we you know we we built a platform to roll franchises out all across the country our intention is to have a thousand franchises uh 20 in every state in america um, we built five mega centers around the country right now vegas uh, beverly hills miami arizona and we use those as platforms to train um, clinicians and physicians. Because remember, I'm not licensed to practice medicine. So we have licensed physicians, MDs, that are licensed to practice medicine that actually can read and interpret blood work and prescribe therapies for patients. So what's your background then? So my background is really in research. You know, I, I undergraduate degrees were in biology. Um, my postgraduate degrees are in human biology with a neuroscience concentration. And for 20 years after graduating uh, from grad school, uh, I worked as a mortality expert in the insurance industry. So, so what what would you do? Like guess when people are going to die? Like <laughs> it's what really, does that mean? <laughs> it's kind of uh it's kind of gruesome but um kind of morbid but um you wouldn't believe the number of financial services instruments that are actually based on when you're going to die. Um I mean life insurance is uh, the obvious one but annuities, reverse mortgages, all kinds of financial services instruments are designed around how many more months you have left on earth. I mean you can write a check to a to an insurance company called a uh, SPIA, single premium immediate annuity, and they will guarantee you an income stream for the rest of your life. Mm. And what they're really guaranteeing you is an income stream until you're no longer on this earth. And to calculate that payment, they use uh, your mortality, what's called your specific mortality. Life insurance companies, same thing. If they're going to put you know, 5 million or 10 million or $25 million worth of risk on your life. They really don't care where you are on an actuarial curve. They want to know specifically how many more months does this person have left on earth because we're only betting on one variable. Um, you know, there's only a single variable that matters when once they issue a life insurance policy. And insurance companies have data that no other medical enterprise has, you know, no clinical study, um, not even the U.S. federal government, um, 
And that is that they know the day, the date, the time, the location, and the cause of death for anyone that they've insured, right? Because it, as a requirement to get a death claim, they need you need to file a death certificate and it gives you exactly what did you die of, where did you die, how did you die, um, what day, what, what's the date, what was the time? And they take that information and, and essentially backtrack into your medical record and look at the genesis of what led to that. Mm. So if we got five to 10 years of medical records on you and five years of demographic data, um, then you know, we could tell the insurance company how long you had to live to the month. No, <laughs> so that's crazy. And and it's it's astounding. Um, you know, it, it, I believe if this database could just see the light of day, it would permanently change the face of humanity. Just because people would be freaked out and well, not just that people would be freaked out; they would realize um, how ineffective a lot of very common treatments are, and how. Um, relatively simple it is to stay out of the system. You know, we're very good at crisis medicine. I'm not anti-big pharma. I'm not anti-modern medicine in any way. You know, if I hit a windshield at 20 miles an hour, I want a surgeon, I want painkillers, I'm going to the ER. I believe in modern medicine. I'm a huge fan of modern medicine. I believe that big pharma has done a lot of good, but I also believe that modern medicine has a paucity of understanding of basic human physiology. And in this absence of understanding, we, we've created a sick care system. And the system's very good at crisis medicine, uh, but it's very poor at creating optimal health in the population. I mean, if you look at Johns Hopkins study or the, or the Harvard study done in 2016, you know, medical error is the third leading cause of death in America, according mm. to these clinical studies. What's one and two? Studies. <laughs> um, cardiovascular disease and cancer. Okay. Um, but if you think that modern medicine is actually killing more people than morbid obesity and diabetes combined, you get an idea of how ineffective we are at keeping people out of the system, right? And it's medical error. And it's not that physicians uh, woefully are mistreating patients or that the healthcare system is designed against humanity. It's that there's a, a lack of understanding of human physiology. We don't, we don't look at human beings the same way, for example, that we look at plants and trees. Um, I remember in grad school, um, I had to take all these plant botany courses and I, I hated them, but I had to take them. But I'll never forget that when anything went wrong um, in the leaf of a tree or the branch or the trunk of a tree or a shrub or a bush, the very first thing they would do is they would core test the soil. And they would say, what's missing from the soil that could be causing this disease in this, in this tree could be causing, you know, this leaf to rot. And they'd say, oh, there's nitrogen missing in the soil. They'd add nitrogen to the soil and, and the leaf would be healed. We don't think about human beings that way, right? We don't go into the human body and say, what raw material is missing from this person's body that could be causing this condition to have, mm. happen? I'll give you a perfect example that I saw hundreds of times. If you go into if I could go magically into your body right now and just deplete vitamin D3, colocalciferol, the, the, the sunshine vitamin. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be tan. You wouldn't be tan. <laughs> <laughs> number one, you'd lose your tan. Yeah. yeah. Um, but number two, you know, this is arguably the single most important compound in the human body, right? I mean, human beings have hundreds of vitamins in our bloodstream, but we're only capable of making one, vitamin D3. Um, there's scantily a single cell in the entire human body that doesn't have a receptor for this vitamin. When it's depleted, you know, it has an effect on our immune function, our hormone function, on all kinds of on all kinds of things. So if I was able to go into the body and deplete vitamin D3 in about 50% of the world's populations, clinically deficient, darker complected um, um, populations are even uh, in the 85% or more range um, because the darker your skin, the less vitamin D3 you, you generate from the sun. If I was able to deplete this, eventually you would present with rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms, right? Your joints would start to ache, the soles of your feet would be sore and achy when you got out of bed in the morning. You'd wake up feeling like you um, had a workout the night before when you haven't. Um, you'd notice that you're starting to be brain foggy. Uh, you, you'd probably start to notice that the incidence of getting sick is more frequent. And if you went to the wrong family practitioner, which I saw hundreds of times in my career, because you present with rheumatoid arthritis-like symptoms, they just diagnose you with rheumatoid arthritis without mm -hmm. doing SED rates, blood work. And generally they will put you on something called a corticosteroid. And so now you have a missing raw material in the human body, D3, colocalciferol, that's led you to seek medical advice. You're misdiagnosed with a condition you didn't have. You don't have rheumatoid. 
Um, you started a corticosteroid, which was a prescription you didn't need. And we knew from the database that once you started a corticosteroid, you had uh, roughly six years in one day until you were having a joint replacement. Mm. So now six years in the future, you're having a joint replacement. And now that joint replacement causes a reduction in mobility, what's called a, um, your ambulatory profile, how well you ambulate. So now you've been diagnosed with a condition you don't have, put on a prescription that wasn't needed. It, it ended up having a joint replacement that wasn't required, reduced your mobility. And now you can bring in all of the diseases that exacerbate with re reduced mobility. You know, sitting is the new smoking. Mm. Right, sedentary lifestyle is the leading cause of all cause mortality. So now you're six years older, seven, eight, nine years older, and you're having conditions from reduced mobility that you wouldn't have had possibly ever in your life. Because we're just so much on the internet and our phones and work is sitting a lot now. No doubt. I mean, aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. Mm. We have to Stop telling grandma not to go outside, it's too cold, not to go outside, it's too hot, just to lay down, just to relax, right? Just to eat at the first pang of hunger um, because this is collapsing all of our natural defense mechanisms, mm. right? The more aggressively we seek comfort, the weaker we become. Right. 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 So <clears throat> to me, it sounds like our system today is very reactionary. Oh, you've got an issue. Let's treat it. Let's fix it. Let's, you know, put a Band-Aid on it. And you're on the other side, like, what can we do to prevent these things from happening? Because we know they're going to happen. Right. You know, I, I believe that um, th there's a term in, in medicine called idiopathic, right? In Latin, it means of unknown origin. It's basically a way of saying, we have no idea. All right. So you have idiopathic hypertension, idiopathic anxiety, Id idiopathic hypothyroid. Um, you have idiopathic lots of things. And... I don't believe that anything in human beings is idiopathic. I don't believe it's of an unknown origin. I just believe we don't know the origin because we haven't asked enough questions. Mm. And human beings, um, we, we function um, very much the same way. So when you start depleting things in the human body, you deplete hormones, um, you deplete certain vitamins, you deplete nutrients, you deplete amino acids, um, then you have very specific consequences from that. And so the first question in my mind that we should be asking and when presented with any condition that someone is facing is what raw materials missing from this body that could cause this to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, what could cause a rise in the inflammatory amino acid homocysteine, which could then cause the vascular system to clamp down, which could then cause a rise in blood pressure and lead to something called hypertension. And instead of saying, well, you have hypertension, we can't find the source, so we're gonna medicate you. Say, you know, we have hypertension, we need to search for what things could be missing from this person's body that could cause this condition. Mm. Um, and I, I just picked on hypertension as one, but you right. know, there's a whole myriad of issues. You know, my, my sincere belief is that most of us are walking around at about 55, maybe 60% of our true state of normal. We have accepted such an erosion of our baseline sense of normalcy that we have forgotten as a society what it's truly like to feel normal. Mm. I mean, most, most, you know, uh, you know, yeah, being tired and, and brain fog. You're like, yeah, yeah I mean, just, just except brain is. fog. And, you know, I just don't sleep that well. And, um, uh, you know, and I, I've got a little bit of weight gain or water retention. Um, you know, I've lost my libido. I, I have a really poor response to exercise now. I used to have a great response to exercise. Um, you know, my mood's just been numb for the last few years, right? The peaks and valleys of mood are gone. You know? I think though, a lot of people can just say, well, I'm getting older. That's a, that's a classic misnomer, <laughs> right? Yeah. None of these are consequences of aging, right? I mean, aging essentially isn't. So is it in my mind that like, it's harder for me to maintain my physique? as I get older, or what do you believe? Um, what I believe is, yes, it's harder for you to maintain your physique because, you know, as we get older, a process in the body called methylation um, starts to become less and less and less efficient. So, you know, aging at the end of the day is truly a mitochondrial disease, right? The mitochondria inside the cell, um, which is the powerhouse of the cell, becomes increasingly less functional, less powerful, and you're essentially powering down the human body. And there are lots of ways that we can restore health, healthy mitochondria, um, not the least of which, which is free, which is exercising and, and, yeah. and, and mobility. Um, you know, I can't emphasize enough how we just don't move enough as a society anymore. But 
The second is to understand that there's not a single compound known to mankind, not one, that enters the human body and is used in the format that we put it in. So there's no vitamin, mineral, nutrient, amino acid, protein, carbohydrate, nothing that we put into the body that's used in that form. Everything that enters our body goes through this process of being refined mm -hmm. into the usable form. This refining process is called methylation. Mm. And when methylation breaks, it's not just broken in one cell, it is broken in every cell in the body because methylation is governed by the DNA. And so what happens is when we deplete certain raw materials, simple things like B vitamins, um, vitamin B12, mm. uh, methylated folates, uh, amino acids, then what happens is any process that requires that ingredient in the human body is now deficient. Mm. It's, it's literally like going to a bakery chef and saying, listen, you can bake whatever you want, but you just can't use butter. <laughs> well, it doesn't, doesn't sound like a big deal, right? It's one ingredient. Right. But just imagine the number of recipes it would affect. So if you go into the human body and you just affect the methylation of tryptophan into serotonin, that simple conversion process, well, now you have a deficiency in serotonin, mm. um, which is one of the definitions of depression. Right. Right. Serotonin is the main driver of mood. It's, it's, a, it's a structural component of all of our elevated emotional states. So as we get older, if this methylation process gets less refined and our serotonin drops, we become less passionate, less elated, less joyful, less aroused. Our libido is off. Right. You start to deplete dopamine, you drive behavior. You deplete dopamine you know, um, enough, you will drive addictive behavior. Right. right. The absence of dopamine is the presence of addiction. Mm. And so going into a human body and just testing it, looking at you know, blood work and genetic testing. And the, th the reason why I'm a huge fan of gene testing is that um, there are some major genes of methylation. And these genes, when they are not operating properly, can be supplemented for their, for their deficiency. And, you know, like I say, when DNA is not functioning properly, it's broken in every cell in the body. Um, and this is the genesis of a lot of the most common ailments that we face. I mean, if you think about cancer, all cancer is DNA replication run amok. Mm. It's aberrant DNA replication. Yeah. So, and you think about the DNA, that's the CEO of the cell, right? We know that DNA makes the cell divide, but it also gives the cell all of its instructions on what to do all day, every day. It's right. called transcription. So when that process breaks down, we get slowly sick over time and we accept these as a consequence of aging. And we don't have to do that. No. I, I mean, I'm not a big believer in supplementing for the sake of supplementing, but I'm a huge believer in supplementing for deficiency. Right. So when somebody goes to you at now 10X Health, um, let's walk through like what happens. So the first thing is you do a gene test, right? Mm -hmm. And that's basically what I have here. Yes. So I think the easiest thing to do is walk me through for me, okay, on on what I need to be doing. So, I'll give you my my gene test. Okay, this is your and, gene test. So we're gonna put yep, this up we'll, on the we'll, screen. We'll for b-roll this for everyone who's watching on YouTube, okay, so you'll be able to see it. Uh, if you're listening, you know we'll we'll do our best to verbalize it. Yeah. So um so if you look at these um genes, remember we actually develop our personality around our genes. Okay. So you can tell a lot about a person by what genetic breaks they have and what genetic breaks they don't have, because um. In general, certain gene breaks lead to certain deficiencies. Certain deficiencies lead to very specific outcomes. So the first thing that you should know about this page is that all five of these colored rectangles should be green. Okay. Right? <clears throat> so when they're yellow, it means that one parent gave you the gene mutation. If they were red, which they're not, it would mean that both parents gave you the gene mutation. And what is a mutation that sounds like a bad thing? Yeah, it sounds like a bad thing, but they're very, very, very common. I mean, they're not catastrophic. I mean, it's estimated that 44% of the world's population has, has gene mutation. MTHFR. And, you know, this, this, uh, and this other gene, COMP-T, about 26% of the population has that. So what these genes do is they code for the conversion of certain raw materials. I always use the example that we pull crude oil out of the ground, but you can't put crude oil into your gas tank, right? Because the car doesn't understand that fuel source. Human beings are no different. We put raw materials into the body. If the body can't convert it to the usable form, we now have a deficiency. And that deficiency leads to certain conditions. So when we look at the three genetic breaks that you have, let's start down here with MTHFR. MTHFR is 
It's commonly referred to as one of the worst to have, but the easiest to fix because it's very early in the methylation cycle. And by so, the way, so just so we're clear, <clears throat> I did nothing lifestyle wise. I was born with this. Is that what you you're You were saying? born with this. Yep. Okay. All right. Yeah. The genes you're born with are the genes you'll die with. So this is why you only do this test once in your life. Okay. Um, and by the way, we're not the only one that do this gene test. There's lots of companies that do these gene tests. Um, but if you, if you pull your entire genetic profile, you're going to get a lot of noise, like things that are not actionable. I mean, if I pulled your whole genetic profile, I could say, okay, you have olive skin, you have brown eyes, you have yeah. detached earlobes, but there's nothing you can do with that information. <laughs> it's just, right? it is who I am. It's just, it's just information. Right. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's fine to know your, you know, your heritage, your background, but we want to look at genes that are actionable, meaning while I can't fix the gene, I can supplement for its function. If you just Google MTHFR, make sure you capitalize it, by the way. Okay. You'll, you'll find yourself on some really colorful websites. <laughs> um, yeah. So if you, get, if you Google MTHFR and put the word and, and then put anxiety, gut health, brain fog, um, chronic fatigue, um, and I mean, conditions that you're facing and look at the hordes of published clinical research, peer reviewed, human studied, published clinical research, linking a lot of these, these common ailments in society to a genetic mutation mm. where you have a deficiency in raw material. So what this gene does, is it converts folic acid and its other precursors into the form the body uses called methylfolate. And so again, while that might not sound like a big deal, this raw material goes into all kinds of transactions in the body, neurotransmitter formation. So people with um, MTHFR can have all kinds of, of symptoms, anxiousness, anxiety, mild anxiety. The type of anxiety they have will have three characteristics. Um, primarily, um, they will have had anxiety on and off throughout their lifetime. Um, secondly, um, it's very hard for them to point to the specific trigger that causes it. Mm -hmm. Right. So this is kind of proving that it's not coming from a cluster of symptoms outside their body. And then third, if they've tried anti-anxiety medications, they won't really work. It'll make them feel like a zombie. So MTHFR um, is a precursor for all of these other transactions in the body. When it's broken, the body's deficient of its early raw material that it uses in all these transactions. And very often people that have MTHFR will either have mild gut issues or also have some um, acid reflux. Um, because it affects the motility of the gut. Um, they are particularly sensitive to something called folic acid, um, which might not sound like a big deal until you realize that folic acid is the most prevalent nutrient in the human diet. Okay. Folic acid, I think it was 1993, the U.S. federal government um, agreed to spray our entire grain supply with folic acid. All white flour, white rice, white bread, white pasta, grains of all kinds, are fortified or enriched, which means they're sprayed with the chemical folic acid. And I say chemical because folic acid doesn't occur anywhere naturally in nature. You cannot find folic acid anywhere on the surface of the earth. Why do it. they do it? Well, it was initially because they thought it would prevent a neural tube defect in pregnant women. But the truth is folic acid doesn't prevent anything. <laughs> um, it doesn't. Um, the body has to convert it into methylfolate to prevent a neural tube defect. In fact, pregnant women that take high doses of folic acid and have this gene mutation have very high incidences of postpartum depression. Because what happens to a female that cannot process folic acid when you put 1400% of the daily allowance of folic acid into her body? Mm. She goes nuts and she develops this depressive state. And then eventually the pregnancy ends, they stop taking the prenatal vitamin, the symptoms go away, so they blame it on the pregnancy, not on the vitamin. Mm. And and this is where I where I mean we we have a fundamental, I think, paucity of of understanding about how human beings work. I mean, why would we ever think that something that we make chemically in a laboratory is essential for optimal health? <laughs> right. right? <clears throat> you yeah. know, that's why I always say if you if you have ADHD, you're not deficient in Adderall. That's not what you're missing. Um, if, if, um, you're depressed, you're not deficient in a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, right? You, you're deficient generally in serotonin, um, and serotonin is made in the gut through this process called methylation. 90% mm. of the serotonin in our bodies resides in our gut. So if you don't have it here, you can't have it here. 
Right. So depression rarely begins in an outside cluster of symptoms. Um, it usually begins in, in the gut. Inward. So um, as you move up this cycle, you'll see that um, MTHFR, which can lead to a myriad of conditions. So you would want to supplement with something called 5-methylfolate or something called folinic acid, which is just the already converted form of this nutrient. So, um, for example, we, we talked about patients misdiagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. One of the common things they do with these patients is they put them on something called methotrexate or, or a um, corticosteroid. This actually blocks your body from processing folic acid the same way MTHFR does. Mm. It actually gives you this gene mutation artificially. And what's the number one complaint of people that go on these corticosteroids? Gut issues. Mm. The second complaint is a state of depression because serotonin that moves the gut also creates elevated emotional states. And so when we supplement with methylfolate, there are clinical studies that show, um, there's one that was just published on Georgian women um, that showed a, a significant link to pre, between depressive states and a lack of folinic acid or methylfolate. Mm. And so when we supplement with that, um, we see a lot of these conditions eviscerate. Wow. Um, as you move up the chain here, you get into um, gut motility. So when when these genes are affected, um, it it changes the motility of the gut. These people think they have allergies and they can't point to the specific reason why they're getting bloated um, or they have gas or bloating or diarrhea or constipation or irritability. And they can't seem to link it to what they just ate because it's not related to what they're eating. It's related to the pace of the gut, the speed of the gut. And as you move higher, um, you get into uh, genes that quiet the mind. This one at the top is called COMPT. It stands for catechol transferase. Just a fancy way of saying it breaks down catecholamines. And what are catecholamines? Ephedrine, norephedrine, dopamine, what we commonly call uh, adrenaline, right? So people with these gene breaks, especially these red gene breaks, they are generally night owls. They have very active minds. Right, because remember, human beings, we don't just create thought. We also dismantle thought. It is just as important to be able to degrade thought as it is to create it. Mm. The reason for that is if you are creating thought at a faster rate than you're breaking it down, your mind becomes clouded. Mm. So these people are night owls because when their environment quiets, their mind wakes up. Mm. Right. So most people, if you're listening to this podcast, you'll lay down to go to sleep. And you'll be body tired, but you won't fall asleep because your mind will keep you awake. Right. You'll be thinking about the most innocuous little thoughts, mm. right? I mean, did I get everything on my grocery list? Uh, does my belt match my shoes? You know, did did I return that email? Right. Um, so you're, you're looking at mine right now, and mm -hmm. I have, uh, I can see it. So I have a couple of greens, and so I have two greens, three yellows, no reds. What, um, I, I guess, what's the average? Like how many... What do you typically see as a ratio? So um, what I typically see as a ratio, I mean, I've, I've only seen maybe five all green gene tests in the 27,000 that we've done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so so don't feel bad. I mean, you're you're in really good company. And, and, you know, and again, I don't want to say genetic mutations me makes people think like, oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm cursed. No, you just have to know. Um, yeah, you just, you want to know what your body has difficulty processing and what it yeah. doesn't. So you can just give it the fuel that it can use. Right. And um, so one of these is the conversion of something called homocysteine into something called methionine. Again, that doesn't sound like a big deal, but homocysteine is one of the most inflammatory compounds in the human body. It's natural at certain levels. It's very inflammatory at high levels. And so what this causes is a very, very active mind. So people with your genetic profile um, have a tendency to develop something called consummate overachiever profile. Okay. Um, and it's it's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, Grant Cardone has it. A lot of patients have it. Um, it's where you are um, very hard on yourself. You know, mm -hmm. you're kind of your own worst enemy. And the reason for that is you hold yourself to a very high standard. Mm -hmm. um, the more disorganized we are in the mind, the more we crave organization in our outside environment. So usually these people are night owls. They despise clutter. Um, you know, if they're working on a project, they the the desk they're working on needs to be clean. Usually the room the desk is in needs to be clean. Um, they set a very high standard for themselves. So they will judge the success or the lack thereof of their day based on how many things they get done on an agenda they set for themselves. Yeah, I can agree and, with 
basically all of those things for me, except, so I hate clutter. Obviously I'm hard on myself. I'm an overachiever. You know, I am super task oriented. I just want to knock out task after task. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'm not is a night owl. Hmm. I'm a much more of a morning person. And like, I just, my mind, I mean, it's always thinking throughout the day, but when I get, when it's at night, and I, I lay down, I'm like off. That's great. I mean, and usually with this comp team mutation, especially when this one is red, you have a very hard time quieting the mind. So this is probably also diet related. If you ate a diet very high in folic acid foods, white bread, white flour, white rice, white pasta, high in grains, cereals, you would find that you had difficulty not only with digestion in your gut, but you would find that you had difficulty quieting the mind. So Gary, I don't know if you know this. I used to be a pro baseball player. So oh, I used to uh, do a lot of testing on myself with just diets and workouts and things. And so for me, um, I've tried every diet and training regimen under the sun. I've tried keto. I've tried, you know, high carb, you yeah. know, no carb, every, yeah. whatever you imagine. High, but one thing I've always done is always high protein. So I'll always, every day I will eat 180 to 200 grams of protein a day and yep. I'm 180 pounds. Um, but what I found was every time a trainer would put me on a high carb regimen, mm -hmm. the flours, the rice, everything, I would get super like bloated. I would feel like crap and I just never have liked it. And I always perform better with like little to no carbs. Right. And I was just like, and I, I would have digestive problems, like not to get too in depth, but like it just wouldn't be good. Right, right. I mean, I, I'm not surprised by that at all. In fact, that's what I was saying. You with that genetic predisposition, um, it's it's not actually the carbs so much as it is the folic acid, the type right? of carbs. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, because they're coming from white flour, white rice, white bread, white pasta, and we don't call it sprayed with folic acid. We call it fortified or enriched. I mean, think about this. That so I shouldn't know, eat anything white is what you're saying. Not unless it's organic. Right, because organic, even some organic, still say fortified or enriched. You want to get organic, get organic sources that are not fortified or enriched. I hear people say all the time, you know, it's crazy, Gary. I eat a sandwich here and I blow up like a tick, or I have a slice of pizza here and I blow up like a tick. But I went to Italy for fourteen days, and I ate like a pig. I ate pasta. I ate, um, I ate flour. I ate French baguettes, and I was fine. Right. Well, because the, that bread doesn't have, first of all, seed oils, and it also doesn't have high amounts of folic acid. And if you think 44% of the population has this gene mutation, that means 44% of kids have this gene mutation. Mm -hmm. You think about what we feed kids before they go off to school. I mean, a standard American diet. Um, Pop-Tarts, white bagels, PBJ. cereal. PBJ. <laughs> yeah, cereal, PBJ. If you pump that much folic acid into a child with that gene mutation, it will be a full contact sport to get them in the car to go to school. By the way, do you do these tests for kids too? No question. Yes. Okay. Um, in fact, I think my kids early, are four and two. Yeah. I mean, as soon as they can chew and swallow, um, you know, then you can on their own, then you can, you know, you can do this test and you can have an, an okay. impact on them. It also tells you kind of how to guide their diet. Right. And, um, and then to your point, you know, I, I often find myself in this debate when we talk about low carbohydrate diets, but understand that there are, um, essential fatty acids, right? I mean, essential means they're necessary for life. Right. There's two of them. If you don't get these two fatty acids, you'll die. Um, there are essential amino acids, right? There's nine of them. If you don't get these nine essential amino acids, you'll also die. Um, there is no such thing as an essential carbohydrate. Real quick, if you haven't heard, my book, The Wealthy Way, is coming out December 13th. I have been working on this book for years and I'm super excited about it and I wanna have a massive launch and I need your help. So here's what we are going to do. You can actually pre-order the book on Amazon right now on the Kindle version. And the best part is that Kindle version is only gonna be 99 cents. Now this book is a lot more valuable than 99 cents, but I wanna get it in everyone's hands. So you can support by ordering it there right now. Now on December 13th, you can get access to the paperback, you can get access to the Audible and all that good stuff. But that's not all we're doing. If you wanna really support and leave a review for the book, I'm actually going to be giving away a free course that I created called Business Builder Academy. This is teaching everyone how to start a business from start to scratch, how to figure out your branding, your products, sales, marketing, everything that I've done to start up all of my businesses, I've put into this academy and I'm gonna give it to you completely free 
as long as you leave a review on Amazon. So think about it. You can go buy the book for a dollar, leave a review, and get a course worth thousands. So if you want to support and you want to get access to that, go to wealthywaybook.com, okay? Wealthywaybook.com. You'll be able to go pre-order it. You'll be able to submit proof of your review, and you're going to get access to that course. So I appreciate all you guys. Let's have a huge launch for this book and change some lives. Right. You can get by just eating so meat. So if you just marinate on that, you know, we realize that um, there isn't a such thing as an essential carbohydrate, meaning they're not essential for life. So, I'm not, and again, I'm not telling everybody they need to be on a keto well, diet or well, they need to stop because, eating carbs. But Well, you know, so I just interviewed Liver King a couple of weeks ago. Okay. And... You know, obviously, Liver King's got his whole controversy with steroids and stuff. Right. And we could talk even... I'm curious about your thoughts on TRT and things like mm -hmm. that, too. Yeah, I'd love to talk. Um, but basically, what he was telling me was like, you know, I honestly don't eat that many carbs. Like, I eat mainly just uh, nose-to-tail meat. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I eat a ton of fat and a ton of protein. And he's like, that's just the ancestral lifestyle. It's the way our ancestors mm -hmm. ate and and everything what do you it, that sounds like no, what you're I'm, vibing I'm, with yeah i'm a big big believer in that it's <laughs> that the source should be clean meats you know like in 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 miami i i actually joined up on amish farm okay um, <laughs> <laughs> i became a member of an amish farm um because they deliver um grass-fed grass-finished beef um free-range pasture-raised uh chickens you know they eat worms and grass and bugs um they they deliver eggs they deliver non-homogenized non-pasteurized dairy so i get all of our creams dairies yogurts um and and actually milk from there um that's non-pasteurized non-homogenized doesn't have carrageenan doesn't have all of these uh this nonsense added to it like sugars by the way before you keep going like why i i hear this all the time that you know, the big food companies are destroying food and that's what's jacking us up. Most of it's actually not food. Yeah. Like, is it just purely for profits? Like, why are they doing that? It's for mass production. I mean, if, if you understood how seed oils, for example, were processed, right? They don't actually start out that bad. Um, but take canola oil, for example. Um, I've heard it's know, terrible. It's terrible. I mean, they realized that when they sprayed um, these crops with glyphosate, which is a pesticide, when they sprayed them with glyphosate, um, it would actually kill the seed. So what they did was they genetically modified the seed of canola so that it could withstand glyphosates. And now once they harvest it and they actually press it in to in an attempt to make an oil, it actually comes out very gummy. So they actually have to degum it with something called hexane, which is not only a known neurotoxin, it's a highly carcinogenic. So first it's degummed. And then they heat it um, above 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which completely denatures the oil and turns it rancid. It's mm. absolutely the most disgusting rancid smell <laughs> you've ever smelled in your life. If you've ever been to a canola factory, it's hard to even right. get near uh, the building. And so now that it's rancid, they have to um, deodorize it. Um, and they use sodium hydroxide, um, which is another known neurotoxin and highly carcinogenic. Um, and they will also use... Uh, bleaches to bleach the oil to turn it clear again because it's cloudy. Mm. So it has to be degummed. It has to be bleached. It They're just trying to make it look good. Yeah, like and, that's all it and, is. And then they bottle it and put it in on the shelf. I mean, it doesn't resemble anything like it did when it left nature. Right. I mean, at first it starts being genetically modified, um, and then it ends being completely an industrial seed oil. In fact, canola oil was originally um, used as a machine lubricant. Yeah. When um, you know when they tell me about all these things with like the beyond meats and like they're, they're like, oh, too terrible i know i'm I like mean, looking i'm like me. how can you tell me this is better for you like this is the most yeah. this is the biggest scam it is on the, the earth. biggest <laughs> it is just the biggest scam on earth i mean there's a war on protein right now that i don't understand because muscle is our metabolic currency right it's an organ right our, 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 it's like our skin is an organ but our muscle is an organ too and there's something called sarcopenia which is age-related muscle wasting and sarcopenia is directly tied to all cause mortality because the weaker our musculature and the greater the fat to muscle ratio, the higher the incidence of all cause mortality, the less m mobile we are, um, the more prone we are to joint injury and whatnot. If you look at the NFL season after they came back from um, COVID, you had the highest number of non contact injuries in the history of the league. Right. Now, why is that? Because we took a huge break. From conditioning. People weren't moving. Yeah, people weren't moving. And then all of a sudden they moved a lot. And we had, I mean, all of a sudden you heard of people growing PCLs, posterior cruciate ligaments, which 
you don't ever hear about in in sports or very very yeah. rarely so acls mcls lateral collaterals you had all kinds of hip and rotary injuries in the ankles and the knees um because the musculature had been compromised from taking um from taking time off and it's very important to have um lean muscle mass especially as we age it determines our metabolic rate it determines um, um, how many, you know, our caloric intake, mm -hmm. all kinds, all kinds of things. But going back to your gene, uh, chart here, you'll find that when you have this consummate overachiever profile, it's, you'll, you'll find that it's very easy for you to get disappointed in other people because you'll feel like they just can't do the basics. Yeah. So, um, I'm like, just do it. I don't understand why you can't do it. Yeah. I don't understand. It doesn't, people with that genetic profile don't understand it yeah. because, because it's so inherent to them. Yeah. Um, that they believe it comes easy for other people. Okay. Amazing. I have a question about this though. So I've always said this to like the night owls and like the people who have from your definition, the red in that one gene. Comp T. Yep. <clears throat> I'm like, you just need to be more disciplined and like learn to shut your brain off. Like how much of it is mental discipline versus Jeanette? Like th there's gotta be a balance, right? Yeah. But it's, it's one thing to say, shut your brain off. It's another person to be that it's another thing to be the person with the active mind. Right. It's like, um, I always say you can't reason somebody out of depression. You can't reason somebody out of anxiety. It's very hard to reason somebody um, into shutting their mind off. And, and by that, I mean, um, first of all, we have to understand that the brain, as, as sophisticated as we like to think it is, it does not know the difference between perception and reality. It truly doesn't. So if we understand that we can elicit the same response in the mind without the presence of a stimulus, uh, um, what I mean is, let's say you drove home tonight, you got out of your car, somebody was standing in front of you with a knife. Very real threat, right? Your pupils would dilate, blood would, um, your heart rate would increase, extremities would flood with blood. You're, you're having a flight or flight response. Right. But you could be laying on the 40th floor of a condo and start thinking about getting eaten by a shark and have the exact same reaction. Mm -hmm. The chances of a shark making its way out of the ocean and up 50 you know, flights of steps or right. taking the elevator up are zero. And me trying to reason you out of that fear because there's no chance a shark's gonna come attack you will not change that situation. Right. So now that we understand that the brain um, can actually solicit the same type of response, whether there's the presence of a fear or a stimulus or not, then we start to understand that it's coming from our physiology. So the reason why people can't quiet the mind is because they are not degrading thought at the rate that they're creating it. Mm. If you ask them what they're thinking about, I promise you, they are thinking about the most innocuous little thoughts. Nothing that couldn't wait till the next day. Nothing that has to be thought about at that moment. And certainly not anything that is life-changing, yeah. right? Or loss of a loved one, something that should keep you up at night. So once we understand that, then we say, well, how do we quiet the mind? We put the right amino acid balance SAMe and people that are deficient, L-methionine and people that are deficient, B complexes, um, specific B vitamins, so that the the brain has the resources to degrade catecholamines. See, people that have that gene mutation will also say things like, uh, "I work really well under pressure," um, and the reason why they say that is because. Um, really, what they're saying physiologically is, "I lack the ability to set priorities internally." So I use external pressure to set my priorities. Mm. And so what happens is they end up going from nine alarm fire to nine alarm fire to nine alarm fire to nine alarm fire. Um, and they, they get things done, right? Um, they never miss a deadline. But if it's due uh, September 29th at, at 9 a.m., they finish it September 29th at 8.59, yeah, yeah. right? And so they get used to working under pressure because pressure drives their priority because their mind is so active, they even have a hard time setting priorities. Whereas if you supplemented for that deficiency, cleaned up the diet so that you had the right raw materials, um, then you would find that that, this, that priority setting becomes much easier. The active mind begins to quiet, that you actually can lay down at night to go to bed and your mind won't wake up. Mm. That makes sense. So it starts inwardly, getting the right supplements mm -hmm. to offset this. And that in turn should help you become just, in my words, stronger mentally. Like, yes. To be able to do these things. No question. Okay. So like even with what you're seeing on my gene chart, it will always be that way, mm -hmm. no matter what, right? And so it's just making sure I get the proper things for and, my... And 
Yeah, if you're going to supplement, supplement for deficiency. Right? So what, I, what like would I, said, I be taking based on what you see? So you'd be taking 5-methylfolate, um, a B-complex, which is just pyridoxine, riboflavin, thiamine, niacin, panathenic acid. Um, and it usually comes in a single capsule. Um, and um, L-methionine. And I just take that every day the rest of my life. You would take that combination of things every day for the rest of your life. It'd be a game changer for you. Mm. Just putting those raw materials into your body would be a game changer for you. And what about diet? Um, so a diet low in folic acid, which you sort of discovered on your own. Right. Um, so the, you know, the high carbohydrate diet also was high in folic acid. And so when you talked about the bloating and, and the gas and all the other complications that you had when, when, you know, you were trying these high carbohydrate diets, what you were feeling were the consequences of changing the motility of your gut. Mm. You see people that have that gene mutation should really try to avoid folic acid. It's astounding what happens to children when you strip folic acid out of their diet. It's astounding what happens to human beings that are that have that gene mutation when you just pull folic acid out of their diet. So folic acid, to be clear, is anything basically white carb, like a white carb is basically it. Almost all white carbs, white flour, white rice, white bread, white pasta, all grains that are fortified or enriched. Right, we we de we decided not to but call to, it, but to make it simple, right? Because yeah. most thing, if Anything I go to the restaurant, or enriched. yeah, they're gonna, yeah. Have, it's gonna have a white carb, or yep. it's, it's probably gonna be fortified. Yep. Okay, that makes it simple for me. Uh, now, now I noticed with 10x Health, you guys also have um, these like machines and things mm -hmm. too, right? So it's like, all right, that's step two, get supplements. Right. Is that is are the machines step three? Like, and then and then step three because we want to take you as far as you want to go towards being a superhuman. Yeah, um, and we call it the superhuman protocol. But essentially all it's doing, this superhuman protocol is taking everything that's good about mother nature from outside and bringing it in, right? We get three main things from mother nature. We get magnetism, we get oxygen, and we get light. Magnetism from the earth, I mean, uh, earthing and grounding is a very real thing. I mean, if you think about the last time that you had bare feet touching bare soil, yeah. dirt, grass, sand, probably been a long time for yeah. most of us it is um and we're certainly not doing it on a daily basis human beings build up a charge we actually discharge into the earth believe it or not so to mimic this magnetic field we use a pemf mat pulse electromagnetic field there are hordes of published clinical studies i have tons of them on my instagram i have tons of them on on our website uh at 10xhealthtest.com um, I'm a huge believer in data, but if you look at what happens to the human body when you expose it to low Gauss current, a magnetic current that's similar to the surface of the earth, you'll find that you can repolarize. You can actually, um, the surface, you can change the, the uh, charge on the surface of the cell. So what happens is that causes your, your cells, especially your red blood cells, to separate and become free floating. One of the things that happens when we become slightly acidic is our cells start to clump together and stick up, mm. stick together. Okay. Um, when we become more alkaline, um, then cells start to separate. And remember, alkalinity is a charge. pH stands for potential hydrogen. So if you want to change the charge in the body, you run low Gauss current through the body, not drink alkaline water. Mm. So... With all of those those things, yeah, or, we, the, the PMF. Sorry, then the second one is the oxygen. Yeah, yep. it's called Hypermax, um, and so we we take ambient oxygen, we run it through an oxygen concentrator, we fill up a bag uh, full of about nine hundred liters of ninety five percent O two. You put a mask on and you cycle for ten minutes in the morning. Right. So you put this mask on, you breathe ninety five percent oxygen. It raises what's called the partial pressure. It floods the blood with oxygen, and once the blood is flooded with oxygen, then we lay you in a red light therapy bed and we drive that oxygen right into the mitochondria. Mm. It is phenomenal because- And that's daily? Um, three days a week. Oh, three days a week. Three days a week. I mean, it's it, because the modalities are so expensive, we're, we're gonna put them, um, we're gonna put this superhuman protocol um, inside every wellness center that we have across the country and eventually having 20 in every state because we want, the masses to have access to it. Right. So they can just get a membership, come in and use it as often as they want. Um, two, oh, three you're going to have like a gym membership. Yeah, these, like a gym uh, membership. And you just come in and you use Superhuman two or three days a week. I mean, it will wipe out jet lag. It'll improve um, 
cognitive function. It'll deepen your delta wave of sleep. It'll restore your waking energy. It'll upstage your mitochondria. It'll actually um, flood the mitochondria with oxygen. Right. Um, these are all things you can measure, by the way. Right. Um, they're, they're, the effect of it is measurable. Wow. So what did you see going on with like guys like Grant and Dana White when they came on as clients? So um, Grant's main issue was joint pain, brain fog, um, lack of energy, really, really, really poor sleep. Um, very sore and achy in the mornings when he woke up, like he had a night uh, workout the night before when he hadn't. Soles of his feet were sore and achy when he got out of bed. So, be, but before, like, I mean, Grant's in his 60s now. Mm -hmm. And Grant, I mean, he 64. looks great. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he looks amazing. But like, I mean, he's 64. Like, yeah. shouldn't that stuff happen? Um, some of it happens, but look yeah. at him now. Go back on his Instagram four years ago when we started working with him and look how he looked then. He looked 15 years older right. than he does now. It's been four years um, since, since I started working with him and he looks 15 years younger. And so we went into the blood work. I, I pulled 64 biomarkers in his blood and the clinical team looked at those biomarkers and said, okay, he's deficient in... Um, He's got a hormone deficiency. He's got these nutrient deficiencies. He's got uh, this issue with controlling blood sugar. We worked on blood sugar, hormone deficiency, nutrient deficiencies, not super rocket science, no big secrets. Um, and then we supplemented him for his genetic breaks. We supplemented him for the genetic deficiencies in his body so that in effect, those genes didn't have as big of an impact. And the same thing we're talking about with me. Same thing we're talking about with you. And so what happened to Grant? Sleep immediately deepened. Waking energy went through the roof. His youthful exuberance returned. He started to take on a more youthful appearance. We also use peptides, um, which are um, you know amino acids that we use to influence different um, functions in the body. Um, balanced the hormones, um, got his blood sugar under control, and then he started using superhuman. Started right. using magnetism on a PMF map oxygen in a bag and light from this red light bed. Um, and it's just and same thing we did with Dana. Yeah. yeah. And Dana and I just did a podcast um, where we actually took his before and after blood work and we put it up on Instagram because a lot of people said, oh, it was just the keto diet that made all those changes. And that's not, that's patently false. <laughs> so, you know, you yeah. don't get on a keto diet and get off all your blood pressure medication and thyroid medication and, yeah. um, and you know, uh, diuretics and, and all of those things that, that Dana was on. Um, and right now he's actually not on any, uh, prescriptions any wow. longer. I think he was on seven when we started. That's crazy. Um, and, uh, two of them were for blood pressure. So you mentioned deep sleep and I've talked about this before. Um, I've had other doctors on the show. Um, and they, they basically were like, yeah, you know, deep sleep is super important. You know, if you're not getting that, that's like your regenerative, um, sleep and, and everything else. And I, I got one of those aura rings to test mm -hmm. it. And I found out that my deep sleep was like insane. You know, I, I sleep about, I, I sleep on average about six hours a night mm -hmm. and my deep sleep is always over two hours. That's excellent. Yeah. And cause I've always wondered, I'm like, why I can sleep very short periods of time and feel great. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. I sleep very short periods of time. Um, I mean, I think we went to bed last night at 11.30 and I got up at five this morning. So five and a half hours, I feel amazing. Yeah. Um, but I also go straight off a cliff. I get a <laughs> lot of Delta sleep and I come straight out. So, you know, s sleep is a uh, an issue that gets overcomplicated in my opinion very often. And there's really two types of broad reasons why people are not sleeping. Um, one is, and, and I ask a lot of physicians this, why is it that people that are the most exhausted sleep the worst? Because you'd think that people that are tired all the time would sleep the best. Right. But the truth is the reason why they're tired in most cases is because their blood is low on oxygen. Mm, this right? is my wife's problem. Yes. So you show me somebody on, on their blood test um, uh, that has low red blood cell count, low hemoglobin, you know, red blood cells kind of like a tennis ball and hemoglobin is like the fluid in that tennis ball. It's inside that fluid that oxygen is bound. Right. So if I start pulling those tennis balls out of the bloodstream and I take the few that are left and I drain half the fluid out of them, there's not much place to carry oxygen. So people that have low red blood cells, low hemoglobin, mainly because they're low on hormones, um, are have low oxygen transport to begin with. Right. So they're tired all the time. 
Because everything that you perceive about energy is nothing more than oxygen in your blood. If you told me, Gary, I had a lot of energy today, physiologically what you're saying is, I had a lot of oxygen in my blood today. Mm. So if oxygen equals energy, which it does, then if we wanna raise your waking energy, we need to raise the amount of oxygen your blood transports. And so now take somebody who's borderline anemic or just low on red blood cells, low on hemoglobin, not transporting oxygen well. Now they go to sleep, right? So they lay down. What's the first thing that happens? Their respiratory rate starts to fall. So now they're, as their respiratory rate falls, they're bringing in less oxygen right. to a bloodstream that's already poor at transporting it. So it just, it just keeps so going So now they kind of begin itself. to mildly suffocate. And what does the brain do when it notices your blood oxygen get low? It pulses cortisol to wake you up. So these people look like a bouncing rubber ball going down a hallway. They can sleep 11 hours and not wake rested. That's my wife. She right? sleeps a lot and she has... Um, you know, issues with fatigue and so, yeah. So here's what we, you know, when I talk about the biometric chain in the human body, when, when you take a condition, somebody has like, I'm low on energy and you convert that to physiology. What it really means is I'm low on oxygen. So now when you say, okay, we're low on oxygen, let's trace that back into the root. All right. What, what, how could I raise blood oxygen? Well, I look at the red blood cell and hemoglobin. Um, if I see that that's low, I say, well, where are red blood cells and hemoglobin made? They're made in the bone marrow. So now you go to the bone marrow and you say, well, why are you not producing enough red blood cell and hemoglobin? Um, well, we have to go to the boss of the bone marrow, which is the hormone testosterone. In um, men and women, the, one of the primary roles of testosterone is not male characteristics. It's not aggression, facial hair, deep voice, muscles. The primary role of testosterone is to put pressure on the bone marrow to create new red blood cells. It's called mm. erythropoiesis. So if you show me somebody who is deficient in the hormone testosterone, I will show you somebody who's very likely deficient in red blood cell and hemoglobin and is also tired. So then if I go, well, what's testosterone made out of? Well, among other things, it's made out of DHEA. So are they deficient in DHEA? And then if I go below that and say, well, what is DHEA made from? Vitamin D3. So if I want to restore this biometric chain, I go vitamin D3, raise that to the optimal range. DHEA, raise that to the optimal range, and then see if that moves the hormones. Mm. Because if it does, it's gonna fix the rest of the chain. If not, then you go to the hormone and you correct the hormone level. And there's a bunch of ways that you do that. You can supplement, you can, you can use TRT, you can actually use boosters to boost testicular production of testosterone. And once you put that hormone back into the optimal range, you'll see that the bone marrow begins to spit out new red blood cells. It raises the number in the bloodstream, transports more oxygen, they have more energy. Mm. So speaking of TRT and just, you know, I guess there's a very difference between TRT and steroids and all these oh, other yeah, things. Oh yeah, huge. Yeah. So what are your thoughts on that for, because I mean, you're just seeing everybody want to get on it. Right. Like, what are your thoughts? Well, so my thoughts are, if you look at the um, American Journal of Urology, which is widely, especially for men, is considered the Bible for male endocrine therapy. In 2018, um, they published their new testosterone guidelines. If you actually Google American Journal of Urology Space Testosterone, and then when you pull that article up, you look down at, start at question 13, you'll see something called um, uh, practitioner guidelines um, and counseling of a testosterone deficient patient. And basically what this is, is, is advice to physicians on what they should say to patients that are deficient in testosterone. And it blows through all of the old myths that testosterone is linked to prostate cancer, that it increases cardiovascular disease, that it has an uh, increased rate of thrombolytic events, you know, um, stroke, heart attack risk. And it actually updated those to say that the testosterone deficiency is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Mm. Um, there's, there's, of all of the organs in the human body, the heart has the highest number of receptors for testosterone, um, 10,000 roughly. So when we are deficient in testosterone, we're deficient in mood, we're deficient in generally in red blood cell hemoglobin levels, our heart is deficient in testosterone. So I'm a big fan of hormone therapy that puts hormones back into the optimal range. Okay. And you see the, the challenge with hormone therapy is it's not so much about the levels as it is about the ratios. Like if you look at women, for example, their level of estrogen is not as important as their ratio of estrogen to other hormones. Okay. Perfectly normal in a female menstrual cycle to be have estrogen in the 400s. It's perfectly normal for their estrogen to be in the teens. So if the range is 400 to 
19. Um, how do you know that 121 or 160 or 220 is high or low? Well, you don't. You have to look at where they are in the cycle and compare that to other hormones. As long as they stay in the right ratio, they're fine. You take a man that has estrogen in the high 40s, but his testosterone is 900. There's not an issue. Take the same man with estrogen in the 40s and his testosterone is 190. Yeah. Massive issues. Weight gain, mood, um, brain fog, lethar lethargy, water retention. Right. Um, so ratios in human beings are very, very important. So I'm a huge fan of of hormone replacement therapy when when it's needed. Um, I'm a big fan of peptides. There are all kinds of uh, peptides right now, peptides for anti-aging, peptides for skin, for hair. There are peptides to restore youthful levels of growth hormone in the body. Um, they generally don't carry a lot of the side effects that other exogenous um, things do, taking them from outside the body and putting them in. They're amino acids um, for the most part. They're amino acid sequences. So the body recognizes these, actually metabolizes them. So there's things we can do to rewind our pituitary to a more youthful level of growth hormone secretion. There are things we can do to um, restore healthy gut function and seal the gut. Mm. Um, there are healing peptides like BBC-157. There are even some peptides that are targeting um, increasing telomeres, one of the hallmarks of aging. There are telomerase peptides, um, one's called epitalon. Um, there are peptides targeting anxiety, anti-anxiolytics like Selenc. Um, so a lot of these peptides, and they have well-researched human clinical trials, no, some of them not done in the U.S., but still human trials. And so our clinical team believes that they pose significantly res less risk than a lot of chemical-laden alternatives. Mm. So do you have any opinion on, I mean, I know ratios are important for anything, mm -hmm. but especially when it comes to testosterone, do you have any issues with age or specific times to wait well um you know the when you pull blood work generally it's it's age dependent right, right. so um there are ranges for a postmenopausal female and a premenopausal female there are range, ranges for um young men and older men right um so so some when when you look at blood work for example ranges are adjusted for age igf1 it's on like growth factor is different in a 20 year old than it is in a 50 or 60 year old. Right. Um, so it's the optimal ranges that are important. You know, yeah. what is the optimal range for uh, sugars? Where are the optimal range for testosterone? Was the optimal range for IGF-1? Um, some of these other markers that get suppressed as we age. I mean, right. We know now that if we keep levels in the optimal range, um, then we restore optimal function. Right. 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 So it's not, and you know, I guess basically the problem becomes when people are in range, but they just want to be way above range. Right. Supraphysiologic levels are where all the problems come from, right? Um, meaning levels that are multiples of the optimal ranges. You know, people that take high doses of growth hormone from outside the body and put it in run the risk of shutting off um, their pituitary secretion of growth hormone. Right. See, there's a there's a hierarchy in the body, and there's a there's a command system. There's a captain. There's a first mate. There's a second mate. And whenever we go into the human body and we replace function, we want to obey this command hierarchy, right? So, growth hormone, for example, which is a big one in the news lately because of the liver king issue. Um, you know, the brain um, gives commands to something called the hypothalamus, which gives a command to the pituitary, which then secretes growth hormone. So the brain's the captain, the hypothalamus is the first mate, the pituitary is the second mate. If you take high doses of growth hormone from outside the body and put it in, then basically the second mate is telling the first mate what to do and the first mate's telling the captain what to do. So you never want to reverse what we call upstream regulate. You want to try to obey that the hierarchy in the body, the phys natural physiology in the body. Right. And that's why we went from... Um, you know, early TRT was people were doing a single shot a month. And then it went to two shots a month. And then it went to once a week. Now most people do blended testosterones twice a week to try to keep their levels looking like rolling hills rather than looking like heart monitors, mm. right? Because when we dose in a non-physiologic way to replace a, a, a physiologic deficiency, then we create a whole set of other problems. Right. 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 So... um, 
I hope I answered that question. I feel like I yeah, just yeah. hit your face and <laughs> no, no, went no, down a rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it, I, makes, it makes a lot to of go sense. On tangents, man. I apologize. No, because I uh, <laughs> get excited about this stuff. You know, so many people ask me about this stuff, and like, look, I got a lot of entrepreneur friends who have not taken care of their body, right? Mm -hmm. And they most certainly they're not workout fanatics. They weren't pro athletes. Like I, I'm very much an experimenter mm -hmm. with my body and. You know, it, even when I was playing sports, you know, I watched guys take steroids and, and other things and I never did it because I was just like, yeah, I mean, morally, I didn't want to do it. And as I get older now, I'm 33, um, I'm like, okay, it, well, I'm not competing in sports or anything, so I could do whatever I want with my body at this point. Right. Like, what's the optimal thing to right. do? And so from what I've been told by many people, it's like, hey, don't get into any of that stuff as long as humanly possible. Like, I agree. I mean, there's no reason to replace healthy function um, that doesn't need to be replaced. You know, right. I would say that 70% of the hormone therapy patients that are 10x patients are you know our doctors don't put them on hormone therapy. They restore optimal levels of hor hormones with in, in most cases without taking it exogenously. As soon as you begin to take hormones, other things from outside the body and put it in, you naturally start to slow down or even shut off your own production. At 33 years old, the last thing you'd wanna do is be dependent on hormones yeah. for the rest of your life. Um, but if, as you progress in age, if you develop true testicular hypofunction where you're not producing adequate levels of hormones, then replacing is not only um, the right thing to do, It's it's very healthy for you. Yeah. Um, and again, if you look at um, one of the best places to go to see the consolidated research is that 2018 uh, Journal of American Urology publication on testosterone guidelines because the links next to the claim will actually show you the clinical studies that support those claims. Yeah. And now we understand that we can restore youthful levels of function by restoring youthful levels mm. of um, hormone balances and ratios in the body. Right. And that's, you know, that's what happened to Grant Cardone. That's what happened to, um, you know, Dana, Dana White. So do you believe that humans are going to live a lot longer with just all these things? Oh, no doubt. I mean, there are people walking alive today that are going to live to 140 plus. Really? No question. That's crazy. No question. I mean, with what we know about intermittent fasting and cellular autophagy and senescent cells and- You think 60 is like the new 40? 60 is easily the new 40. I mean, look at Grant Cardone. He's 64 years old. He doesn't look, act, or perform like a 64-year-old man. I spent a lot of time with him. Yeah. He is one of the most acutely sharp human beings. Yeah, his ever. mind is still functioning very, it's yeah. Like a 30-year-old. Right. And, and he has the energy of 10 men. Um, and he's clear. He's cognizant. Short-term recall is on point. Um, you know, he, he doesn't, nothing about him resembles a 64-year-old man. Um, and if you look at him biologically, he's much younger, right? So now we're starting to How do you do those biological tests to um, see like how old you are? So biological age and chronological age are, are the judge on a whole myriad of factors. One of the big hallmarks is telomeres. Um, and if you haven't heard of a telomere, you can look down at your shoelace and see that little plastic tip that's on your shoelace. Uh -huh. This is kind of like the tip of a chromosome. As that plastic tip gets shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter, eventually it's gone, that shoelace will fray. Right. Right. So this is the same thing that happens to a chromosome. So the length of a telomere um, is correlated to your biological age. So you can't do anything about chronological age, right? That's how yeah, many yeah. years you've been on this earth. But your biological age is um, how youthful your your biome is. And with the advent of peptides, um, things like uh, intermittent fasting, which, which helps your body clean up uh, senescent cells, cells that are no longer doing a good job in your body. Are you a um, fan of intermittent fasting daily? I'm a, I'm a fan of intermittent fasting for people with poor blood sugar regulation. Okay. Right. I don't think intermittent fasting is good for everybody. Just like I don't think keto is good for everybody. Okay. Um, and just like I don't think vegan diets are good for everybody. But but we know um, Beyond Meats is not good for anyone. Beyond Meats is not good for anybody. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'd rather, I'd actually rather eat the plastic carton that comes in than eat the Because <laughs> I'd just crap that out. <laughs> um, exactly. So, um. But, uh, and this is true with a lot of inorganic, you know, vegan sources. We could go down that whole rabbit hole later. But um, uh, because I, I actually get 75% of my caloric intake from fat. And really? I have the same blood fat as a vegan. The last time I pulled my triglyceride, was about 60 days ago, it, they were 45. So you're um, saying 70% of your diet is fat? 75% of my diet is, uh, 70 to 75% of my diet, caloric intake is from fat. 
And then you're saying what the other 25% is protein? 20% protein and probably 5% carb. You know, it, it's so funny. The more I talk to you, the more um, I realize you <laughs> have very similar things to what Liver King was saying. Because mm -hmm. I asked him the same thing. I said, tell me about like the ratios. What do you think your macros are? He's like probably like 70% fat. He's yeah. like, I don't really eat carbs. Um, and then he, he was saying the same thing. He's like, you got to go grounding. You've got to get get the sun. You've got to do all these things. Yeah. And he's like, the truth is most of us are not getting enough sun. It's not that we're getting too much. We're not getting enough sun. Yeah. And we have no idea how responsive the human body is to light. Right. We are light beings. Photobiomodulation is the rage in sports recovery, anti I love light. longevity. Yeah. I do too. I remember when I was playing ball, I used to love day games. I'm like, dude, I just feel good. Yeah, it's just great well, being out here. Well, in population mortality, and, and I used to be, a, you know, in, in the mortality space. If you look at look at life expectancies, the longest life expectancies on Earth are centered right around the equator, and um, for every, I think it's twenty degrees uh, latitude that you move away from the equator, there's a precipitous drop in life expectancy mm. until you get to the poles, where you have the shortest life expectancy on Earth. When I was born, a true Eskimo had a fifty six year life expectancy. Mm. Right, they got very, very little sun. Right, brittle bone disease, horrible immune systems, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, um, um, osteopenia, osteoporosis—all of these conditions that come from actually lacking light. With, with eating so much fat, how much protein are you getting a month or like a day? Like how many grams? So twenty percent of my, I, I, I get close to, and and again, the grams of protein don't equate to the total caloric intake. So I, when I say seventy-five percent, I mean. 75% of the volume I eat is not fat. 75% of my caloric intake is yeah. not fat. So I still get a high amount of protein. I'll eat, I'll eat grass-fed fatty ribeyes. I'll eat, um, you know, wild-caught salmon. I eat a lot of coconut oil, olive oil, nuts, avocados. Um, so a lot of fatty sources, whole eggs. Um, I also believe that we really only need about four or five um, oils in our diet. You know, you can use coconut oil, ghee butters, tallow, um, or grass-fed butter for cooking um you don't like olive oil i like olive oil and avocado oils at room temperatures okay. right they'll denature at high temperatures so they'll turn rancid um whereas coconut oil butter ghee oil tallow are, are great sources of fat that you can use to cook with and they taste amazing and they give you high you know yeah. calories um i post my instagram i post my blood work by the way the instagram um, every time I do it, every few months. Yeah. Because I get a lot of flack from the bro science community saying, well, if you eat that much fat, you're going to get um, hypertriglyceridemia. Your cholesterol is going to go through the roof. I have mildly elevated LDL cholesterol and I've floored out triglycerides. So how, much, so how much, I guess, do you know your macros? Like how many grams I don't, of protein? I don't measure the macros, but I, um, um, I weigh 205 pounds. So I probably get about 190 to 210 grams of protein in okay so you're doing what yeah. i do yeah i just eat more carbs right now but i i've always want i'm like dude they say i'm not gonna have energy if i don't have any carbs and i'm like i don't know that it's true <laughs> dude I, I i i get the energy sucked out of me when i eat carbs yeah so if you look at you know again what does energy mean everything you perceive about energy is nothing more than oxygen in your blood so um if i was to actually put different meals into this 30 foot tube that we call the intestinal tract right and remember your, your intestinal tract's 30 feet long it's enveloped with blood vessels right and the amount of blood in your system is fixed the amount of oxygen in your system is fixed so if it's here it can't be here mm. so if it's if it's in your gut it can't be in your brain why do we get sleepy after meals especially after high carbohydrate meals i mean right. try eating a basket of bread and a bowl of pasta <laughs> and then tell me how you feel in 25 minutes why is that because Pasta and and breads are high glycemic, high carbohydrate, right. spike your sugar and insulin, but they also cause all of that blood to flood to the digestive tract to digest it. It takes significantly more blood and significantly more oxygen to digest carbohydrate than it does fats and proteins. Mm. So, um, so what happens is you eat a high glycemic meal, um, and then all that wonderful blood and oxygen from your brain floods to your gut and now you're exhausted and you're foggy and you're tired what do you think uh, so i've heard a lot i've talked to multiple people who are like carnivore diet type mm -hmm. people and basically they all think vegetables are poison a lot of vegetables are poison i mean they have lectins they have all kinds of mechanisms in them to protect themselves from predators just like yeah just like we do um and a lot of these are gut destroying um you know 
peanuts, for example, which aren't really nuts, they're seeds, they're legumes, are full of mycotoxins and, and lectins. A lot of uh, vegetables have high amounts of lectins, which are like- the, So do you like eat spike. vegetables? I eat very little vegetable. Really? You know, I, eat, I mean, I eat asparagus. Are there any that's like good? I eat asparagus, Brussels sprouts. Um, I'll eat uh, uh, heads of broccoli and I eat arugula. Okay. Those are my go-to. But other than that, and you're lots like, of avocado, I don't, I don't want technically any. a fruit. Yeah. But fruit's fine. Um, fruits are fine. I prefer fruits that end in berry, um, blackberry, raspberry, blueberry, strawberry, yeah. the lowest on the glycemic index. But remember fruits, especially if you're going to spend money anywhere on organic nutrients, you want to spend money on organic fruits okay. because fruits absorb nutrients through their skin. There was actually a recent um, publication that I read about um, inorganic strawberries where they actually took inorganic strawberries right out of the supermarket. They pressed them and pulled the juice out of them there was enough pesticide left over in the juice that they actually pressed out of the strawberry, inorganic strawberry, to respray the crop. With Shut pesticide. up. Uh. Send me a text, I'll send you the article. Um, <laughs> and I believe that because, because you spray a pesticide on the skin of a fruit or an herbicide or insecticide, and it's gonna draw that into the fruit, mm. right? So, so. My, uh, my main thing for 2023 is I definitely want to take my health way more seriously because mm -hmm. I've kind of, I've just been a young dude, just like, yeah, I look good. I'm freaking feel good, like whatever. And I know that I can't do that forever and right. I have to be very intentional. And so I'm trying to get answers and research and talk to lots of different opinions. But it's funny because the more people I talk to, the more share what you're telling me and I mean, a lot of us have and reached it's, it's, the same conclusion. We yeah, and, I, through and different I, doors, I naturally but. kind of fell into that conclusion too over years of trying things. Um, so it sounds like to me, I need to, number one, focus on, you know what? People tell me vegetables and carbs are good. It's not necessarily true. I need to just... It's patently false, actually. <laughs> okay, it, it's 100% it's false. So I need to just continue to eat my freaking red meats, my fish. And I mean... It kind of gets boring just eating meat. Though. Like, what what else do I eat with a meal? Like, I don't want to just eat I meat. Mean, meat, fish, chicken, eggs. Um, I know, but like, there's no sides at that point. It's just purely meat is like my meals. No, you can still have vegetables. It's not your primary source of intake, and and choose organic vegetables. Right. The the, the a lot of the issues that that happen from our diet are less about what we're eating than what our food eats. So. Um, non-grass-fed meats have significantly more of an impact on atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis than grass-fed meats because this omega-6, omega-3 fatty acid ratio. Vegetables that, um, inorganic vegetables that are full of pesticides, herbicides, insecticides, preservatives are, you know, when you're putting those kind of chemical-laden things into the body, that's where the perversion in function comes from. Okay. So I'm going to I'm gonna clean up my diet with that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to supplement what 10X Health prescribes me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to look into getting on the superhuman. Yep. Magnetism, oxygen, and light. That's a game yep. changer. Um, and sounds like that's really all I need to do. Is there anything? That's it. And then to develop a consistent morning routine. I've been um, doing that for years. There's like, yeah. Okay. So great. I mean, most entrepreneurs have some kind of morning yeah. routine. And I don't say that one is an absolute better than the other. If you wake up and you journal and in gratitude and um, you know, you do a little breath work and then some light cardio, but a consistent morning routine, I don't know anything from a physiologic standpoint that will have a greater impact on your longevity. Yeah. That's our body's crave routine our, our, and our, um, you know, our, our circadian rhythm is highly dependent on routine. I mean, mine is very simple. I wake up in the morning. I, um, uh, I get a cup of black coffee. I go right out onto my porch at first light. Um, I never miss first light, um, unless I'm traveling. Um, I do eight minutes of breath work. Um, I get done with the breath work. I have a huge glass of hydrogen water, and then I go in and do superhuman and hit the gym mm. every day. Yeah. No, we have, um, so that's what the Wealthy Way is all about, just helping entrepreneurs live yes. truly like fulfilled lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And I created a uh, planner that people can get for free to help keep them on their routines. And that's stuff. awesome. So anybody can get that at wealthyway.com. You know, um, the thing that this gene test will do, because we, I feel like we spend a lot of our lives trying to manage time. Yeah. And it's virtually impossible to manage time. Um, but you can manage focus. Right. And, you know, the more highly focused you are, the more time you get back. And so by helping your mind prioritize and focus and become less foggy and, and increasing your waking energy, which is why I'm such a huge fan of the 
of gene testing and supplementing for deficiency, you get a lot of focus back in your life and therefore you get a lot of time back in yeah. your life. No, a thousand percent. So my last question, my wife, so she has low thyroid. Hmm. What would you consider with that? Oh, so, and by the way, I'll, let me preface this. So we found out she had low thyroid from a doctor I had on the show. She took a blood test and or whatever we took. And then, you know, it, it got flagged. And so she went to a, um, what, I don't even know what you'd call it. A holistic doctor. Natural right? path or yep. holistic path. And, you know, he basically put her on gluten-free and some other supplements. I don't know which one's which, but, um, she's like, I've never felt better going gluten-free, like doing this. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, because interestingly, um, and again, I'm not a physician, so I can't give medical advice, and this is not meant to be medical advice. <laughs> um, but if um, if we look at how the thyroid functions, right, the thyroid secretes two hormones, T4 and T3, right? And that's what it does. Um, only the little known fact about the thyroid is that it only produces 20% of the T3 in your blood. 20% mm. of the T3 hormone is produced by the thyroid, which means when it's low, hypothyroid, there's an 80% chance it's not the thyroid. Mm. And yet in 100% of the cases, we medicate the thyroid. We hold the thyroid responsible for a crime it's not committing. And we do this constantly. We do this with a lot of organs and we, um, we punish them for crimes they're not committing. So the question is, if it produces T4 and it only produces 20% of the T3 in our blood, where does the other 80% of the T3 come from? Mm. It is methylated from T4. It is converted T4 into T3, which happens outside the thyroid in the gut. So by changing her diet, one of the reasons why she feels better and has likely seen changes in her thyroid is because there never was anything wrong with her thyroid. Right. People tell me all the time, like, oh my God, Gary, I started taking those supplements and it fixed my thyroid. And I remind them, it didn't fix your thyroid. There was nothing wrong with your thyroid, <laughs> right? Yeah. To begin with, it fixed your methylation. When you give the body the raw material it needs to make these conversions, T4 into T3, magically T3 rises and you no longer have hypothyroid in some cases because there never was a condition yeah. wrong with the thyroid. So I hate those terms, hypothyroid. We should say hypo T3. Right. Where does T3 come from? Oh, 80% comes from the gut. We should be looking at the gut first and say, let's fix methylation by diet, getting folic acid out of their diet if, if they have the MTHFR gene mutation, supplementing with the right um, raw material so they can convert thyroid hormone T4 into T3 and then see what happens. Right. And then just get out of the body's way instead of hammering a perfectly healthy organ for something it wasn't committing. Right. This happens with a lot of hypertensive patients too, people that have high blood pressure. Mm. The most common form of high hypertension is called idiopathic hypertension, hypertension of an unknown origin. Got it. And you look at these people, normal heart sounds, normal lung sounds, normal EKG, normal EEG, normal dye contrast study, normal cardiac cath. They can't find anything wrong with the heart. The right. pressure's still high. But when you look at their methylation, you find they can't bring homocysteine down. Mm. And when they can't bring that infla inflammatory compound down, it narrows the arteries, it irritates the arteries. And if I make the arteries smaller, pressure goes up. So as soon as you bring that homocysteine down, in many cases, the arteries relax, pressure returns to normal because nothing was wrong with the heart. Mm. Well, dude, the way that you can explain everything is unlike anything I've ever heard with how the body oh, is awesome. working. Thank you. And um, I'm super excited to get on this regimen. I'm excited yeah, I'm fired to- up for you too, man. Like, get more feedback that, okay, liver King, you know, whatever you think about him, you think of him, but then to hear it from you too, and like to have experienced them, like, all right, I'm going to really go for this. Um, and so I'm excited. Uh, I'm actually going to get my family to do the the test too. So we can make sure we understand their best gift situations too. Yep. And, uh, yeah, that is a good gift. That's yeah, a Christmas it's great gift to get right to hell. <laughs> uh, if somebody does want to get somebody a late Christmas gift by the time this airs, where can they find this? Um, they can go to my Instagram, just at Gary Brecca. Um, and on the Instagram, on my link tree, you can order the test or you can go to, uh, 10 X, the number 10, the letter X health test.com 10 X health test.com. We'll link to that down below and we'll link to Gary's Instagram. Gary, I appreciate you coming out, man. Means appreciate being here, man. Yeah. Guys, make sure you follow Gary, subscribe, and we'll see you later. Peace. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. Thanks for making it to the end. The good news is I've got another one that I know you're going to like, and all you got to do is click it right here linking it right here. All you got to do is just click it and you're going to see this new episode that you're going to love.